Chapter 8 of The Game of Life and How to Play It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Game of Life and How to Play It by Florence Scovel Shin. Chapter 8 Intuition or Guidance. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. There is nothing too great of accomplishment for the man who knows the power of his word and who follows his intuitive leads. By the word he starts in action unseen forces and can rebuild his body or remold his affairs. It is, therefore, of the utmost importance to choose the right words, and the student carefully selects the affirmation he wishes to catapult into the invisible. He knows that God is his supply, and that there is a supply for every demand, and that his spoken word releases this supply. Ask, and ye shall receive. Man must make the first move. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. I have often been asked just how to make a demonstration. I reply, speak the word and then do not do anything until you get a definite lead. Demand the lead, saying, Infinite Spirit, reveal to me the way. Let me know if there's anything for me to do. The answer will come through intuition, or hunch, a chance remark from someone, or a passage in a book, etc., etc. The answers are sometimes quite startling in their exactness. For example, a woman desired a large sum of money. She spoke the words, Infinite Spirit, open the way for my immediate supply. Let all that is mine by divine right now reach me in great avalanches of abundance. Then she added, Give me a definite lead. Let me know if there is anything for me to do. The thought came quickly. Give a certain friend, who had helped her spiritually, a hundred dollars. She told her friend, who said, Wait and get another lead before giving it. So she waited, and that day met a woman who said to her, I gave someone a dollar today. It was just as much for me as it would be for you to give someone a hundred. This was indeed an unmistakable lead, so she knew she was right in giving the hundred dollars. It was a gift which proved a great investment for shortly after that. A large sum of money came to her in a remarkable way. Giving opens the way for receiving. In order to create activity in finances, one should give. Tithing, or giving one-tenth of one's income, is an old Jewish custom and is sure to bring increase. Many of the richest men in the country have been tithers and have never known it to fail as an investment. The tenth part goes forth and returns blessed and multiplied, but the gift or tithe must be given with love and cheerfulness, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Bills should be paid cheerfully. All money should be sent forth fearlessly and with a blessing. This attitude of mind makes man master of money. It is his to obey, and his spoken word then opens vast reservoirs of wealth. Man himself limits his supply by his limited vision. Sometimes the student has a great realization of wealth, but is afraid to act. The vision and action must go hand in hand, as in the case of the man who bought the fur-lined overcoat. A woman came to me asking me to speak the word for a position. So I demanded, Infinite Spirit, open the way for this woman's right position. Never ask for just a position. Ask for the right position, the place already planned in divine mind, as it is the only one that will give satisfaction. I then gave thanks that she had already received and that it would manifest quickly. Very soon she had three positions offered her, two in New York and one in Palm Beach, and she did not know which one to choose. I said, ask for a definite lead. The time was almost up and was still undecided when one day she telephoned. 
When I woke up this morning, I could smell Palm Beach. She had been there before and knew its balmy fragrance. I replied, Well, if you can smell Palm Beach from here, it's certainly your lead. She accepted the position, and it proved a great success. Often one's lead comes at an unexpected time. One day, I was walking down the street, when suddenly I felt a strong urge to go to a certain bakery a block or two away. The reasoning mind resisted, arguing, There is nothing there that you want. However, I had learned not to reason. So I went to the bakery, looked at everything, and there was certainly nothing there that I wanted. But coming out, I encountered a woman I had thought of often and who was in great need of the help which I could give her. So often, one goes for one thing and finds another. Intuition is a spiritual faculty and does not explain, but simply points the way. A person often receives a lead during a treatment. The idea that comes may seem quite irrelevant, but some of God's leadings are mysterious. In the class one day, I was treating that each individual would receive a definite lead. A woman came to me afterwards and said, While you were treating, I got the hunch to take my furniture out of storage and get an apartment. The woman had come to be treated for health. I told her I knew in getting a home of her own, her health would improve. And I added, I believe your trouble, which is a congestion, has come from having things stored away. Congestion of things causes congestion in the body. You have violated the law of use, and your body is paying the penalty. So I gave thanks that divine order was established in her mind body, and affairs. People little dream of how their affairs react on the body. There is a mental correspondence for every disease. A person might receive instantaneous healing through the realization of his body being a perfect idea in divine mind, and therefore whole and perfect, but if he continues his destructive thinking, hoarding, hating, fearing, condemning, the disease will return. Jesus Christ knew that all sickness came from sin, but admonished the leper after the healing to go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon him. So man's soul, or subconscious mind, must be washed whiter than snow for permanent healing. And the metaphysician is always delving deep for the correspondence. Jesus Christ said, Condemn not, lest ye also be condemned. Judge not, lest ye be judged. Many people have attracted disease and unhappiness through the condemnation of others. What man condemns in others, he attracts to himself. For example, a friend came to me in anger and distress because her husband had deserted her for another woman. She condemned the other woman and said continually, She knew he was a married man. She had no right to accept his attentions. I replied, Stop condemning the woman. Bless her and be through with the situation. Otherwise, you are attracting the same thing to yourself. She was deaf to my words and a year or two later became deeply interested in a married man herself. Man picks up a live wire whenever he criticizes or condemns and may expect a shock. Indecision is a stumbling block in many a pathway. In order to overcome it, make the statement repeatedly, I am always under direct inspiration. I make right decisions quickly. These words impress the subconscious. And soon, one finds himself awake and alert, making his right moves without hesitation. I have found it destructive to look to the psychic plane for guidance, as it is the plane of many minds and not the one mind. As man opens his mind to subjectivity, he becomes a target for destructive forces. The psychic plane is the result of man's mortal thought and is on the plane of opposites. 
he may receive either good or bad messages. The science of numbers and the reading of horoscopes keep man down the mental or mortal plane, for they deal only with the karmic path. I know of a man who should have been dead years ago, according to his horoscope, but he is alive and a leader of one of the biggest movements in this country for the uplift of humanity. It takes a very strong mind to neutralize a prophecy of evil. The student should declare, Every false prophecy shall come to naught. Every plan my Father in heaven has not planned shall be dissolved and dissipated. The divine idea now comes to pass. However, if any good message has ever been given one of coming happiness or wealth, harbor and expect it, and it will manifest sooner or later through the law of expectancy. Man's will should be used to back the universal will. I will that the will of God be done. It is God's will to give every man every righteous desire of his heart, and man's will should be used to hold the perfect vision without wavering. The prodigal son said, I will arise and go to my father. It is indeed often an effort of the will to leave the husks and swine of mortal thinking. It is so much easier for the average person to have fear than faith. So faith is an effort of the will. As man becomes spiritually awakened, he recognizes that any external inharmony is the correspondence of mental inharmony. If he stumbles or falls, he may know he is stumbling or falling in consciousness. One day a student was walking along the street, condemning someone in her thoughts. She was saying mentally, that woman is the most disagreeable woman on earth. When suddenly three boy scouts rushed around the corner and almost knocked her over. She did not condemn the boy scouts, but immediately called on the law of forgiveness and saluted the divinity in the woman. Wisdom's ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. When one has made his demands upon the universal, he must be ready for surprises. Everything may seem to be going wrong, when in reality it is going right. For example, a woman was told that there was no loss in divine mind. Therefore, she could not lose anything which belonged to her. Anything lost would be returned, or she would receive its equivalent. Several years previously, she had lost $2,000. She had loaned the money to a relative during her lifetime, but the relative had died, leaving no mention of it in her will. The woman was resentful and angry, and as she had no written statement of the transaction, she never received the money, so she determined to deny the loss and collect the $2,000 from the Bank of the Universal. She had to begin by forgiving the woman, as resentment and unforgiveness closed the door of this wonderful bank. She made this statement, I deny loss. There is no loss in divine mind. Therefore, I cannot lose the two thousand dollars which belong to me by divine right. As one door shuts, another opens. She was living in an apartment house which was for sale, and in the lease was a clause stating that if the house was sold, the tenants would be required to move out within ninety days. Suddenly, the landlord broke the leases and raised the rent. Again, injustice was on her pathway, but this time she was undisturbed. She blessed the landlord and said, As the rent has been raised, it means that I'll be that much richer, for God is my supply. The new leases were made out for the advanced rent, but by some divine mistake, the ninety-day clause had been forgotten. Soon after, the landlord had an opportunity to sell the house. On account of the mistake in the new leases, the tenants held possession for another year. The agent offered each tenant $200 if he would vacate. Several families moved. Three remained, including the woman. A month or two passed, and the agent 
again appeared. This time he said to the woman, Will you break your lease for the sum of $1,500? It flashed upon her, Here comes the $2,000. She remembered having said to friends in the house, We will all act together if anything more is said about leaving. So her lead was to consult her friends. These friends said, Well, if they have offered you 1500 they will certainly give 2000 So she received a check for $2,000 for giving up the apartment. It was certainly a remarkable working of the law, and the apparent injustice was merely an opening for the way for her demonstration. It proved that there is no loss, and when man takes his spiritual stand, he collects all that is his from this great reservoir of good. I will restore to you the years the locusts have eaten. The locusts are the doubts, fears, resentments, and regrets of mortal thinking. These adverse thoughts alone rob man, for no man gives to himself but himself, and no man takes away from himself but himself. Man is here to prove God and to bear witness to the truth. And he can only prove God by bringing plenty out of lack and justice out of injustice. Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that there shall be not room enough to receive it. End of chapter 8 Recording by Amy Conger Chapter 8 of The Game of Life and How to Play It by Florence Scovel Shin, titled Intuition or Guidance, is a beacon of wisdom that empowers us to tap into our inner guidance and intuition as we navigate life's journey. In this chapter, Shin illuminates the profound truth that we possess an innate connection to a higher source of wisdom, which is always ready to guide us towards our greatest good. With an uplifting and encouraging tone, Shin reminds us that we are not mere spectators in the game of life, but active participants who can shape our reality through the power of our thoughts and beliefs. She emphasizes that we have the ability to access divine guidance, which speaks to us through our intuition, hunches, and inspired ideas. By paying attention to these whispers from within, we open ourselves to a world of limitless possibilities. Shin's words serve as a reminder that when we align our thoughts with positivity and abundance, we become magnets for the very things we desire. Through real-life examples and anecdotes, she shows how individuals who have embraced their intuition have triumphed over challenges and achieved their dreams. This chapter teaches us that by cultivating trust in our inner guidance and following its promptings, we can confidently take steps towards our goals, even when circumstances seem uncertain. In an inspiring manner, Shin urges us to release fear and doubt, allowing our intuition to guide us towards the right choices. She encourages us to visualize success, happiness, and fulfillment, which in turn attract those very experiences into our lives. With her words, she instills a sense of empowerment, reminding us that we are co-creators of our reality, capable of transforming challenges into stepping stones and setbacks into opportunities. As you read this chapter, you'll find yourself uplifted by the notion that you are not alone on your journey. The universe is conspiring in your favor, ready to provide you with guidance and support. Shin's insights remind us that intuition is a powerful tool we all possess, capable of leading us towards a life filled with purpose, joy, and prosperity. In summary, Chapter 8 of The Game of Life and How to Play It encourages us to embrace our intuition as a guiding force, offering practical advice on how to recognize and trust our inner wisdom. Florence Scovel Shin's words are an inspiring reminder that life's challenges are opportunities in disguise and by harnessing our intuition, we can navigate this game of life with confidence, grace, and success.